I'm going to talk about, wow, which is to talk about the full research creation cycle. So I'm not going to talk exclusively about scientific research, but also about artistic research and how that informs the scientific research one. So in a kind of in a feedback loop. So part of it is talking about how can I come up with a musical idea, investigating the different techniques that are available or that I have to develop in order to do what I want to do, found some issues and try to solve them. And in the end, kind of producing the creative work and performing it and releasing it for a large audience. So talking about the full cycle of practice based research or research creation as we describe it here in Canada. And the name of the talk is Classic Music Going from Rhythmic Latent Spaces to a Web-Based Music Release. So I think you are not still ready yet. Harris, no? I uh, I no. can't find this. I, I mean yeah, I it's 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 it's, it's okay. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna share the um, you know it's not okay, you have to change it because there are a few things that I'd like to Do you think if I make you host? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Make me host and we'll see. So now, no, still not there. I'm a host because I have access to stuff, but it's still not there. What about if you go uh, to the? Can you can you try now? No, it it only allows to share applications, and even now the optimized for video clip setting it's grayed out. No, no, no. The only thing I found here is multiple participants can share simultaneously, which is for dual monitoring. Um, And I'm searching here online on the settings, but I cannot find anything. I'm going to try once one last thing, which is I'm going to log out, login. OK. Just All in right. case. Let's see. Unless this is some sort of weird uh, Queen Mary setting, actually. Good. Let's see. No, it is still there. Um, it's still, we don't have that, that option. Anyway, I'm going to do it anyways. Okay. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, no problem. So. It is possible that, you know, this could be some setting of the Queen Mary accounts that I cannot find. I don't know. I, I don't know. It shouldn't, but. But in general, can, can you share your desktop? Me? Yes, I mean, you teach, you use this tool weekly. No, no, I don't use this for teaching, actually. Okay. 
Anyway, okay, I'm gonna do it. Okay. So you should be looking at my screen now, mm -hmm. actually my application. Okay, so the name of the talk is Classic Music from Rhythmic Latent Spaces to a web-based music release. And if you have any questions through the talk, just pop it on the pop it on the on the chat or just open your microphone and I would be happy to somehow attend it. And Dave Foster, are any of these settings relevant just from Zoom settings? Yep, that's what Heidi was trying to do. So first, who am I? My, my name is Gabriel Villensoni. I run by the artist name Villensoni. I'm an electronic music artist, performer and researcher. And I do scientific and artistic research and I try to combine these two in my own artistic and scientific practice. I play synthesizer, drum machine, sequencers, electronics, and everything that has some, uh, some kind of electronic or, or, or digital component, but I really like melodies and rhythms. I like to embody music, so that's a relevant part of what I like to play with. I have uh, several releases in major record labels and also independent ones in the latest years. Um, and this idea of the new music economy context after many years of touring and playing kind of sent me back to academia. So in the year 2008, I contacted Harris while he was studying at McGill. So what do you think? Is there any kind of artistic input uh, going on at the, at the music technology program at McGill? And so we started to be friends and I ended up doing a Master of Arts in Music Technology and a PhD in Music Technology at McGill. And this is the type of, so here is the thing that I cannot do. So if I click this, it'll open a Firefox link, which I cannot show you guys, but it's okay. So part of my academic research for my master's, I, I was interested in new interfaces for musical expression, which is something that some of you may be working at Queen Mary also. I guess with Andrew McPherson and other folks there. So I was, and I'm interested in touchless gesture control of different types of sound synthesis. So I cannot also show you the videos there, but I was interested in developing interfaces so that with my hands, with a metaphor of catching a sound, being able to freeze and looping a, sounds while you were singing while whilst you were using a microphone so that was an important part of my bulk of my research for my masters and i also apply that same kind of metaphor and gesture acquisition into the, to try to control concatenative sound synthesis in special the um, one developed by dmo shorts at ircam in 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 Paris, no? So, and I've been using this idea of machine learning techniques and tools to learn gestures and control processes and use that for kind of perform at performance time and also for kind of production time and, and recording in any kind of music making activity. For my PhD, I somehow switched my focus and I was interested in music recommendation so instead of putting the focus on the performer and how can we make music in a different way i put the focus on the listener so how can we as listeners enjoy better recommendations and the idea for that was how can if if the if the context of our listening for example the hour of the day the time of the year the the how cold or how hot is if you if you are in a 40 degrees summer night tuesday in london would that, that information would be relevant for the recommendation that kind of things and i use kind of machine learning to find patterns and create listening behavior model models and use those in order to as input signals to the to the recommended system so but lately i have switched focus again and i have been going back into practice-based research so research creation so how can i somehow use what i've learned and what i've implemented in machine learning in order to actual actually feed back into my creative practice so the idea is that 
how can we use that in music production and how can we use that in a in a compositional workflow environment so but i've been i've been doing this for a number of years for example in this ep from 2014 one of the questions that i had as a research creation question was how can we skew the standard pop song, song format you know so i tried i tried to extend in the structures of the song slowing slowing the 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 bpm slowing extremely slow in the beats and doing live live drum programming in 2015 the question was how can i bring liveness and immediacy to the current cold workflow of music production so when we're working with with computers it's usually kind of a archetypical workflow that you somehow follow and you have always had this idea of undo in which you have revisit and you can revisit and you can revisit your production it's a kind of a never ending process it's pretty hard to finish so the way i tackled is was i did all the production in a kind of in a digital domain but then for the actual mixing and mastering i went into the analog domain so i actually went to a recording studio i went into my old days in which i had to, i had three days for finishing a production so no one do so you had to commit for a specific sound and in a specific set of decisions which i think it's important and i value that because otherwise it's a never ending thing. So in 2017, the question was how not to be in absolute control of the musical result while controlling the compositional process. So instead of looking at this album, it's a full length album as a linear process in which everything starts and ends, kind of an archetypical way of working, I use a procedural techniques to somehow set up a process and then leave the process running for a predetermined amount of time that I, that I decide. And in 2018, the question was again about the undo. So what happens to music production workflows, contemporary ones, when there is no undo? So think about you don't have undo. So you don't you don't you, you can't go back. You take a you take a you make a, a recording and you erase the previous one so you have to commit for something um, and in this sense i started using analog analog modular synthesizer so i had to commit for a specific sound and melodies and to stick to them i'm not that concerned about the analog sound of things i love digital sound of things i also work with computers also analog sound is great but, but what i really like about this is that the workflow is different so you you cannot go back so you found something you find something interesting and you have to record it right away because it will be difficult to, to go back. So these are the kind of questions that I that I've been working on in the in the past few years. But since I have this now a background in machine learning and I know how to use it and implement it, and I, I, and I know how to implement it in a musical context, I'd like to come and com combine the expertise in music production and machine learning and apply this, this in, in my artistic, artistic practice. And the idea is to produce experimental creative musical work, but also to reflect on the implications that using these techniques can have on my creative practice in particular and creative practice in general. It's not that I know how to implement a technique and I just use it. So there is some changes, for example, in machine learning, most of the time I've seen that we spend lots of time kind of developing and implementing an, an specific architecture and trying to improve things, but we don't talk, for, for example, about the data sets. We don't talk that much about the data sets we use and the implications that uh, using, for example, other people's data has on or have on our uh, artistic output. So those kind of things also interest me. Uh, and some of the questions that are relevant to me, for example, are how can we, how can one influence generative models to obtain different results? So how can we steer these models? There are lots of many researchers working on self-generating generative models, if I can say that, but to me, it's more important. So, how can we steer that model, kind of in a different way of well, as OpenAI Jukebox, for example, for example, works, and also how can machine learning system be integrated into human created processes and workflow? So, we have these systems. Most of the time, we start by implementing this system in a 
through a command line interface, but that's pretty kind of hard to me to interact with. So how can we use that in a creative or a musical production or music making system? How can, how can it be part of that? So in the work I'm presenting today, I was interested in the modeling of rhythms, in particular of certain contemporary music genres, such as footwork, quam, two-step, post-dub, dubstep, trap, or dembo. Um, so for those of you that may not know, for example, this is a piece of Chicago footwork. You should be able to listen to the sound. Can you listen to the sounds? Through the microphone or through the computer? Microphone, computer. Sounds. That's what the speakers are for. So this is an example of Chicago Sounds. footwork. This is RPVU. That's what the speakers are for. No? RPVU, excellent musician from Chicago, which I saw a few months ago. This is DJ Lag from South Africa doing Chrome. And this is, I mean, I hate labels, but this is what the journalists say. Most dubstep. This is Can from Bristol. So lots of triplets going on here. Just as a mode of example. So. This is the type of rhythms that I'm interested to work with and to model it. And these rhythms interest me because they exhibit the so-called tempo octaves. That is, they can be perceived or they can be embodied at more than one specific tempo. For example, people can dance to a dubstep track at a archetypical tempo 140 BPM, but they can also move with the music as if it was at 70 BPM. Or a drum and bass track, it's 160 BPM around, but you can also embody a, at eight, you know? And also some of the rhythms leave the comfort zone of four on the floor, uh, which is pretty uh, common in contemporary dance music and incorporate triplets as part of their stylistic signature. That is the case of footwork, trap, dembo, or dubstep, for example. And in some cases, that signature is so strong that the tracks are perceived in compound meter. So instead of having kind of a, uh, divisions in multiples of two this could, could be multi in, in in powers of three no um and also i want to explore the different representation that state of the art machine learning techniques can learn from the, these rhythms no uh, and i want to play with models learn from this representation and use them in my own music making and so I am actually interested in, 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 in systems that can be, that are sterile and customizable. So a review, I review, I started the project by doing a thorough review of all available network architectures, model and application for the modeling of rhythms from symbolic music, for example, from, from MIDI files. And I list some of these here in this, in this, in this list of projects and you may be you may know for example the projects for, like music vae drumify and group vae expanded group vae which which all, all of those stem from the google magenta project for example beat blender is a common one um and and you may also be acquainted with rhythm vae by now tokui from from Japan and I actually ended up doing a first explorations with this rhythm BAE you will not again again be able to see this but you may hear it so this is a concert that I did at Mila here in Montreal Montreal So for that, I was actually using Rhythm BAE by Nao Tokui, and that was really great, you know, because it allowed me to learn kind of a latent space of rhythms based on small training data and play with it in real time. But by implementing and playing with these systems and, and Rhythm BAE, I found two big issues. So the first one was that all systems were not designed to encode music in compound meter. 
not even triplet, not even triplet. So I wasn't able to encode the types of some of the rhythms that I was interested in. And this not only affects the contemporary dance music genres that I just mentioned, but also there are also many African and Latin American rhythms that are in compound meter. So for example, in from Latin America and Africa, you have lots of emiola, so two, contra, two against three, for example. So you have two against three, but you can encode that in any of these, in the music, in the binary world of music BAE, for example, in which everything is a powers of two, you know? And the second big, wish, big issue of, I found was about model complexity. See? So to be trained, most of, the, most of the major neural networks available require massive data sets and large processing power to be trained. So usually training takes a very long time and can, cannot be done at home. And this is because most of these systems were designed to learn one big model for many genres at once. And so you end up with a huge rhythmic space in which you can have rock, jazz, reggaeton and house music, all of them living together in the same latent space, which to me as a performer, it doesn't make much sense in most cases. And this is also a typical approach in machine learning system. That is the more data, the better. But when you are designing a customized system, small scales can be more meaningful. In the end, these two issues I just mentioned are problematic because they introduce some biases. Um, I was going the other way. Yep. So the first problem, data structure introduced bias towards particular genres and cultures because the data, data structure can only encode certain types of rhythms, simple meter rhythms. And this is in addition to biases introduced by the data used to train the models. For example, if you just use, if you have a model that can encode compound meter, but you can, you also train, train the system in simple meter, you will end up with a model with just with simple meter rhythms, you know? So it's not, the biases are not only about the data, it's the structure you have to represent your data. And the second problem, the model complexity also hinders access to use these systems, particularly to training and therefore customization because large processing power and massive data sets are often out of reach for us as individual creative practitioners. I don't know how is the situation over there in, in the UK and Queen Mary in particular about access to GPUs, for example, I don't know if you have, if you can leave our process running for 30, 30 days in a large cluster of GPUs, that's pretty uncommon, you know, that we have access to that. If we're working in OpenAI or Google, or we can, we can have that, those kind of things, you know, or Meta, whatever, you know, but it's not common for us. So I decided to work, or we decided to work on these problems and come up with a number of solutions here. So the solutions were actually pretty simple in technical terms, but had strong implications in, creative, in the creative practice. So first, I, and I, I'm gonna say we, because I work in this uh, as a team with other researchers that I'm going to mention later, we extended the data structure to accommodate and encode triplets and rhythms in compound meter. And second, to choose a, we, choo we chose a simpler neural network architecture and modified its data flow and connections to require less data and processing power. So we end up with a diff we decided on the following software stuff for doing a custom a customizable machine learning uh, rhythmic instrument. So for the network architecture, we are using a variational OAT encoder, which are pretty common for implementing a generative system. For the data structure, uh, we used the one proposed by John Gillick in 2019, when he was working at the Google Magenta project, because it encodes not only the onset of rhythms, but also their velocities and micro timings. So we can also have kind of more, what encode the most subtleties of the rhythms. For the machine learning backend, we use the JavaScript version of TensorFlow so that we can port our application to the browser. And also we can use it as a node project. So then we can we use as a node project, we can open it in Max. And then from Max, we can also have it in Max for Live. So we have our project in, in, within Ableton. And finally, we found that the Rhythm BA by now Tokui had most of the features we needed, except the ability to represent compound meter. And so we extended 
that project. So how we extend it? So most systems to encode rhythms follow the data structure shown on your, on your screen, in which that's a full measure of rhythms. On the horizontal axis, you have the number of pulses per measure. So it's usually a 16, you have a 16th node resolution of that. And, and with that, and with that um, resolution, you can only encode, for example, quarter nodes and eighth nodes and 16 nodes. And in general, this is good enough for rhythms in simple meter, but triplets and rhythms in quantum meter need a higher resolution. resolution. So we increased the number of subdivisions in a measure to 96. And with this new grid, we are, not, we are now able to encode up to 30 second triplet nodes. I don't know if you see my, my mouse with a wonderful pink circle, great. And, but also you can encode eight triplets and, and you can also encode simple and compound meter within the same data structure. And this is nothing new, really. This is the same structure that this, our beloved MIDI from 1982 has, but I don't know why all these projects, machine learning projects, didn't were not taking this approach to encoding music. You know, uh, they were using kind of a very simple version of this. So with this approach, we can now encode what we were trying to, to encode. So this is actually pretty good. About the network architecture. BAEs or variational autoencoders follow the structure of a decoder on your left and a decoder on your right. And you know that you have many, I guess, many courses on machine learning, and this is a pretty common architecture. So we train the network with a data set of MIDI clips or a symbolic music representation here on your left. In our case, it's MIDI. And we encode the onsets, the velocities, and micro timings following John Gillick's uh, representation. And at training time, the data, in data the, the data and the input layer are compressed through an iterative process of optimization, so through training, into a lower dimensional representation, which is our latent space. And we call this latent space also, or I call it the performance space also, since it's a, only a b-dimensional latent space, I like to represent and to play it as it, as it was the performance space. And at generation time, we sample this latent space and these data points are decoded, decoded into rhythms that will resemble some of the points of the training data. And this, this idea of having the latent space and the performance space together is it's my metaphor of playing with this instrument. You know, I'm playing with the performance space instead of the latent space, which is actually the same thing. So we implemented this RVAE a neural network, which is an application that uses our data structure and the variational autoencoder architecture. Comes packaged as a Max for Live device so that musicians can easily integrate into Ableton and also as a JavaScript application so that it can be played directly on the browser. And we presented this at the International Conference on Computational Creativity in 2020, so the first year of the pandemic. And I made this with uh, Louis McCallum and Rebecca Fitbring, Fitbring at the UAL whilst I was at the Goldsmiths. The metaphor to play with RVAE is that the performer is in control of an imaginary playback head that we use to retrieve rhythms from the latent space. So we, we somehow explored this, this latent space with this playback head that we are playing. Uh, sampling and decoding the rhythms. And two gestures are possible in this perform performance space. So the first one is clicking. So by clicking, you kind of retrieve and decode the rhythmic pattern. And also by dragging, you create a rhythmic interpolation. And here on the screen, you can see that this is the performance space, which is actually mapped in a one-to-one -one fashion to the latent space. It's limited by a black zone, and, and this is our playback head. There are a few additional knobs for, for controlling how the latent space is sampled, such as threshold and nose, no, noise, and also some mute buttons. Threshold, since the VAE is retrieving probabilities, the threshold is a threshold value in which I used to kind of give me an onset after a specific you get a specific probability. So I can control the density of the rhythms you are uh, somehow 
uh, decoding. And that's pretty useful at performance time because you can go from very, just by controlling your threshold, you can go from very simple rhythms to, to very intricate ones, just if you're in one specific part of the latent space. Um, so, although this system is able to encode nicely rhythms in simple and compound meter, when used it in musical practice, we found a very big issue. So the performance is blind to the space. It's not possible to know beforehand where the rhythm pattern zones are. There are a few systems, for example, Beat Blender, in which you have the samples, the, the latent spaces or the performance space is subdivided sub into small zones and you see kind of little piano rolls of the different patterns, but you're not actually seeing the music. So we wanted to work on a way of visualizing this in, in real time in order to help us as performers, you know? So we came up with this idea of creating a dynamic visualizer of the rhythmic latent space that relies on the dynamic nature of the musical events. And we presented this with uh, at the joint conference on AI music creativity in 2020. And in this work, we work with Louis McCallum, Esteban Maestri and Rebecca Führing. So the idea is that the latent space is discretized over time. We retrieve the onset probabilities for, of each drum instrument. So kicks, snare and hi-hats, for example, for each point in that, in that space. And those probability values are mapped to, grid, to, rank, to red, green, and, and blue. And the resulting visualization is displayed in t uh, over time in sync with the audio, as you can see in this video. And this video is embedded, so we can listen and see it. The peaks are red, snares are green. Green and high header blue. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. Our three places are there. As you may have noticed, all the sounds are also not just samples. Uh, I like to play with the sound of things also. So um, this is this is actually running on a browser, as you can see here. The output of the browser is routed to a MIDI output, and I'm triggering an analog drum uh, sound synthesizer. In this case, uh, it's a Tempest, you know? So I can have more control also on the attack of the sounds, on their pitch, and things like that, in order to provide more variability. Uh, any questions so far? Good, I can keep going. So, I can now put all the software stack into musical practice. So, I spent several months actually working on collecting data from the rhythms I just mentioned, training models, improvising with the latent spaces, adding or removing data points and retaining the models until I got to a point uh, where I had a rhythmic space that was smooth and had enough variability for a specific task. So it wasn't only just developing kind of the architecture, it was about kind of playing around with the data to come up with something useful. Instead of playing with RVA using a computer mouse, as in the example in which I just showed, for, uh, by the way, that was a performance for the Network Music Festival in 2020, um, I use a MIDI controller touch interface to interact with the system. Um, in my case, that was a chaos, but no. And this decision allowed me a more physical mapping between the musical gesture, my gesture, and the sonic output, resulting in a better embodiment of the system, which as a performer, I value a lot. So I like to play standing, you know, and I like to embody the music. And also, I map, as I mentioned, I map the decoded output of the latent space to external synthesizers. Um, all in all, I compose, a, a, I compose and produce a set of nine tracks that I compile on a full-length music album called uh, Classic Music. Um, and all of this is documented on an article for the General of Creative Music Systems, which is soon to be published uh, within the next month. On, 
we are the same authors for this project. Um, we premiered this live at the 21st International Festival for Digital Creativity and Electronic Music, Mutic 2020. And we released it, <coughs> or I released it actually as a full length musical album. But maybe a question here is, what's this concept of, what is this plastic concept that I'm playing with now, no? And here I'm going to kind of stop sharing because we're going to share a different thing. Any one of you knows what plastic means? I, I search it up and it's like a combination of different rocks, right? Like all the things, like sediments that you uh, put together, something like that. Exactly, that, 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 that is actually excellent. And this is a... So our consolidated sediments formed by the accumul accumulation of fragments derived from pre-existing rocks. So when you are kind of, when you're in a current of water, so the flow is there, the water is kind of bringing small pieces of rocks or sand or things like that. And these over time get, get, get accumulated on the bottom, you know? So that was an interesting concept to my project because it, had this, it has this, this idea of that we have new entities that are formed from pre-existing entities. And that's somehow similar to how I was working with for this project. So I was using other people's rhythms for example, or I was using uh, MIDI clips from libraries, or I was somehow mimicking other rhythms, and I was using them in order to create create something new. So, and so that was pretty striking to me. The types of uh, uh, rocks and formations that you can have are could be things like this, for example. You can have big elements like those, which are actually little rocks, or you can have these kind of formations which are smaller, but pretty beautiful also, these kind of things. So it's pretty different, the types of things that you can do. This is called mud rock, sandstone, breccia, and so on and so forth. Shale, and in the end I was actually taking the names of the, the different formations for the names of the of the of the tracks i was i was playing i was doing so after looking at this i somehow realized that there was kind of a nice metaphor and a nice link about this geological term of plastic with how can we use machine learning for a creative practice, in my case, a musical practice. And I came up with this idea of plastic music, no? And this is for the NURIPS uh, Creativity Workshop in 2020, I think. So it's a set of music, plastic music is a set of musical pieces where I play with the geolo geological concept of the class. New entities and forms cre are, are created out of pre-existing fragments. And I explained some of the things that I'm doing and so on and so forth. And this is an, one of the examples of the, of the show at Mutec playing with the latent space through a physical interface. In this, in this case, the chaos pad you will see there and the computer is running there. And I'm triggering the sounds are triggered from the Tempest, which is that small analog synthesizer. You can check that check it later on YouTube if you're interested. So all of the sounds coming from there are actually coming from three latent space in running in parallel. Two of those are drum sounds, and the latest one is 
triggering a physical modeling uh, synthesizer, which is chromophone by Applied Acoustic Systems. And just so that you get an idea, I'm playing here just at the beginning of the show with the physical modeling synth. So I'm using the same neural network architecture to trigger kind of these mallet sounds. By the end of the show, it's kind of it's pretty much more maximalist than this minimalist thing. Okay, so that was about the kind of the the concept I was working with. But since I also like to think about kind of enjoying music in different ways, in the same fashion that I, during my Master of Arts, I was thinking about how can we create music in a different way. And in my PhD, I was thinking about how can we listen to music differently? I am thinking, I was thinking about how can we deliver as, as musicians, how can we deliver music in a different way? So I start also looking at the live coding scene. So I started doing research on Tidal, which is, I guess, all of you know, you know, and this is an example of people playing with Tidal, which allow us to, we could, for example, deliver a process and we can have them, and we can, we can deliver a patch so that people can enjoy it in a way, or we can interact with a command line in order to get new music and so on and so forth. I also, I also check the Zima project. And this is by Francisco Bernardo, Chris Kiefer and Thor Magnusson. So different types of sound. And I also check Fox dot, which is Python, you know. with which you can also achieve kind of interest results. And this was really good. This was running in parallel to my endeavors with classic music. And this was re really great. But first, I'm not a command line hero as the person here. I don't have that funny hat. And the way I like to embody music is actually by actually I like to be standing to play music. You can see me now. I like to play music like standing. I like to embody things. So I cannot make music in front of a command line. I work most of the day in front of a command line. So when I make music, I like to interact with it in a, in a different way. So this didn't seem to me kind of the the most interesting and fun way to play things until. I came up with this project, which is Hydra, which by now I guess many of you know. So instead of it's a live coding environment, not for creating sound or music, by, but for creating visuals, you know. This was created and is still developed by Olivia Jack. And so you can have your small patches here and you can run them direct here, directly in the browser. There's a nice option for kind of randomizing values and randomizing patches. So since I'm not a visual person, this was more kind of interesting to me. I wouldn't use this kind of been standing. I would like to know what, what's going on with those numbers. So I can play with this being seated and I can play with it. Um, I Then I also checked that Haida is is not only kind of a web page or a web based environment. I mean, it's a sorry, it's a web based environment. But you can also load just the library, the Hydra synth, 
as part of another web page which back then it wasn't very well documented i'm talking late 2020 early 2021 but you can have it as a video synth engine for Hydra, so you can embed it inside any web page so that was also interesting to me because i was thinking okay what about if i can have a Hydra synth running within a web page i would be able to somehow release visuals for my music on a on a page and then I'll, then i also found that uh, you could also be able to get your screen your, you you can get the, the feed from your video camera here so that was really interesting and then you can start processing it, processing it in real time and you can then you can do things like this And this was the year of the pandemic, you know, this was the year of, sorry if anyone has kind of issues with flashing lights. I'm gonna... This was the year of, of the pandemic, so I had a show coming on, so I was thinking, okay, people will not be there present, so what about if I try to use this as a video feed that is being processed? The music is processed in real time and that's feeded into a and broadcasted and so on and so forth. And then I also saw that uh, we can also embed videos here as part of Hydra and, and we can process this. So that was really neat. So in the end, I somehow put all of this to, together into one thing. So I'm using the Hydra, the Hydra as a synth in a web page. And then I have all music videos. And I have a patch running on top of this in real time. So, for example, I can find one of the songs, or this one. And I have an interactive patch running on top of the, the music here. And this was when things started to get interesting. I, and I saw this as, as an opportunity to make this as a, as a web-based release, you know? So each one, of this, each one of the tracks have a different patch. And the interaction is different that the user can have. That's it. Um, coming back now to any questions so far? Yes, I wanted to ask you. So you are processing on the web. You are processing with a Hydra patch. You are processing the video that you have there, right? And you apply there, yeah, that, 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 that's interesting. So I have a set of videos. The videos have the audio, kind of like a one audiovisual item. And then I'm using the input of both audio and video as inputs to each one of the Hydra patches. The video feed is yet processed through the Hydra patch. Okay. And also the, uh, for the audio, I'm doing an FFT and using different signals from the FFT output in order to also control the patches. So that it's pretty simple in kind of uh, talking about it, uh, but it's somehow that I haven't seen that much lately. So I think there is a great opportunity here. So I was actually showing this to a number of people and pe people were asking me then, of course, can we change the sound also? How can we, how can we affect the sound? So perhaps that's something that it may be of interest to many people in this group you know and also me so how can we have kind of sound objects embedded or somehow in parallel to a linear audio so that we can also affect the sound something like that that or maybe using a, a game engine unreal or whatever we can do something like that you know but that would be kind of the next step 
So, okay. Yeah, and, and, I, and I have a question. So do, yep. you get, do you get a different video experience or visual experience every time you enter the web page or the, the patch is only controlled by the FFT of the audio? It's controlled by the FFT of the audio and by the user interaction. So you also mouse position, you get some, I'm getting kind of signals from that. If you have, for example, but you, you could do more things. If you, are, if you are using, for example, for example, the version from a phone, you can get signals from the, I don't know, any of the sensors of the, of the phone, and you can use them to drive the, the patch. So it's kind of, there are many possibilities here. Um, nice, it's great. It's great that yeah. you can get a different experience every time, and yet it's still, it's still your videos and has your yeah, ideas. I'm, I'm, as exactly. As it's, as well. The input signal is one video with the audio. The patch is unique, but you can also randomize the values of the patch each time at the, at the, when you instantiate it, and then you can get different signals. So the experience will be different or could be different if you want. So that was nice. Okay, so that's for the part have, of the classic music. I have a question about the Latin space stuff, but do you want me yeah. to ask this later? Yeah, no, go for it now. So um, you're using a two-dimensional one, right? Um, so do you somehow, do you actually label these two dimensions? Do you have, or can you see a clear idea of what this Latin space has learned in terms of rhythm as you as you know we don't know Harris. i know yeah but i'm asking about your as, um, as you know we don't know i actually <clears throat> don't know the labels it, actually each data set creates a new latent space in which what happens is different each time so it's not that you end up always with the same kind of a uh, traits or the on, on the axis so a new data set will end up in a new latent space, so the two axes will be different. So it's pretty hard right. to know what's, what's yeah. going on. It's it's not pretty hard if you have two dimensions because you can get used to it pretty easily, you know? It's easy to navigate. But when you have 32 dimensions, it's pretty hard to know what's going on, you know? And, and if each time you create, you load a new model, those axes are different, it's even harder because you don't have any kind of clue of what's going on you just have to explore it but in a way it's never-ending exploration so yeah, in your application yeah what matters more where you put priority is the exploration um, exactly so for each model i is the performing i need to i need to play with it beforehand in order to know what's going on so i know so in this part of the space i have this kind of thing in this part of the space i have these other kind of things and i can go there and then I go back, you know, that's why I say I like to embody because I'm actually like to know in my chaos path. OK, that part of the port, port of the space with this model ha happens or has an effect on these type of things. And um, so speaking of 32 dimensions, that would be my next question. Are you working on or thinking? Yes, of exactly. That's the next part of the, the, the I have kind of three slides more. It's not that much. Okay. So for now, and um, I'm working. I'm. I've been always interested in neural audio synthesis, as I know that many people in your group are also interested. Uh, so in 2020, when Jukebox, I mean, I've been following, for example, the work by Databots since 2017, and people like that, sample RNN, and many of these. Mel VAE, etc. But in 2020, when OpenAI released Jukebox. I thought, okay, so this is a game changer, you know, so th there is something going on here, something totally new. We can now generate audio with a kind of longer sense of context in a way. So I implemented their uh, neural network. I trained a few. I, I didn't train the models because you need large data, but I fine tuned their model in order to create uh, newer things. But I felt that I wasn't in control of their of of the output you know i was able to iterate a thousand four minutes uh, snippets of audio you know but i had to listen each one of them one by one so i will i felt somehow enslaved to the computer instead of being the other way around in which the computer can recommend to you something you know so listening and cherry picking okay this this is nice 
this is not nice, not nice, not nice. That's boring, you know, it's kind of going through presets of a plugin or a synthesizer patch, nothing too interesting. Until, uh, uh, that's one thing. And the second thing is that since you are not, not in control, since you cannot steer the system towards certain part, I know that you can condition the system, for example, with melody, with sorry, with the lyrics, with genre, with artist. In the case of a jukebox, and also with melody and amplitude in DDSP, for example, you are not somehow much in control of what's going on. Until the beginning of this year, which I started playing with the rave real-time audio variational autoencoder by Antoine Cayon and Philip, Philip Esling from IRCAM, you know? And this is really great because after a long training process, you can actually have inference in almost real time. And then you can explore the latent space that you generate in real, in real time using a maximum SP or pure data patches. So this was a game changer to me, you know, because, okay, I can spend two weeks of training in a large computing cluster here in Compute Cana, whatever. You can have eight GPUs or 32 running. Okay, I can handle that. You can talk with your PI. Can we access that? Okay. But then having that in kind of in in real time to play with is was just great, you know? And these are the type of things that I've been doing lately with it. So that, so that you know, here the this is the NN object, this is the RAID object on Maximus P. I don't know if you have played with it. In, in this custom trained model, which is based on acoustic harmonic data, 32 hours of acoustic harmonic data, it's a data set of those kind of things. It has the output, it's 16 latent, it's 16, dimen 16 dimensions. The latent space has 16 dimensions. So working the, with the 16 dimensions is pretty hard also because there are too many variables and you don't know the access, you don't know the labels of each one of those. So what I'm actually doing is I'm using the old and beloved Wakinator in order to map a lower dimensional latent space of two dimensions, in this case, the, the just a mouse position, into the 16 dimensions of the output, of the input of the latent space of the of RAVE. So this idea that uh, in, is interestingly is that we can use interactive machine learning systems like Wakinator or, or, or uh, InteractML or a move any of these systems in order to go from a lower dimensional performance space to the actually to the actual larger uh, latent space so we can take advantage of that and i've been using this for example this other one is with my friend mar here we are in mallorca we train we have been training a series of models made of spoken voice of friends reading poetry signals from radio signals from historical archives for example carl sagan and so on and so forth and also recording sound from uh, ocean waves within rocks to create a few models and we are playing with those here for example It's hard to see me there, but I'm actually playing with a game truck, which is, I don't know if you have used it. It's a game controller typical for PlayStation 2 that has six degrees of freedom. So it has tethers, so you can get, you can get X, Y, and Z for your two hands. So that's pretty neat because I have now six dimensions that I can control, and I'm mapping those into the 32 dimensions of the other uh, model. 
And so later on, two weeks ago, I was in Paris and with my friend Dedos Muertos, we actually, we hook up the system in La Villette and we played under a bridge with the different models. Oops, sorry. My God. Same thing, playing, playing with the game track. Your question, Harris was really good in the sense that this huge latent space with 32 dimensions has to be explored in a way, but it's what I'm actually doing is finding something interesting, and then I use that position, then I use that setting of the performance space to sorry, I'm gonna rephrase. I'm mapping a well-known point in the lower dimensional performance space to the to the point that I found on the higher dimension latent space. So for example, this position will be linked to a specific voice in that case, for example. This other position will be linked to some something else. And I and I can interpolate between those two. And I can do that in, in real time actually, which is pretty good for a, a performance also. Um, and finally, almost finally, we did a submission for the AI song cost contest kind of uh, two months ago. We didn't win. Winner is pretty good. But this is our contribution. And here we were using Rave for the voices that you will hear now. Which is really neat because we would, I mean, without this kind of machine learning enabled tool, we would never ever would end up with something like that. There are some, a few red derivatives. This is not my work, but it's the work by Moises Horta Valenzuela, which goes by the name of, name of Exorcismus in Berlin. He's just great. He's developing a embedded neural audio synthesizer. He coined it by the name of Semilla. So he has Rave running on a Raspberry Pi, actually. Running on pure data. So this is excellent because you can have on a small computer running this machine learning thing, the inference part of it. So for installation, it's just great. Think about a museum or something kind of a, a musical instrument, actually. actually. He has also been thinking about how this could look and has been using DALI to come up with something like this, no? So, which is nice. So as a wrap up, simple and compound meter can be encoded with the same data representation, finally, which I think is good. We, I think to the best of my knowledge, this is the first time that we have a dynamic visualization of rhythmic spaces. So we can have that for the first time. This is very interesting to me and important. So small data sets are enough to learn useful models. So if your architecture is small enough, first, you need small data. And second, you can do it almost in real time. So this that's good enough, you know, and we need that as uh, creative practitioners, you know, we don't need Large corporations may need large data sets, but if we want to customize things and we want to steer things, we need small data, a small processing power. Just some thoughts. Latent space representations can lead to unexpected surprising places. This is good because you look at your data in a different way. So instead of having, let's say, 12 MIDI clips, you create a space in which those 12 MIDI, MIDI clips are somehow projected but you can also have many things going on in between. Distributed in a non-linear way. And this non-linearity allowed to find new ways of looking at our creative process. Because, for example, you can have a very 
short movement in the latent space, but you can have a large impact in your output. And these are kind of final thoughts. So recent generative system can be still in real time. Finally, I think this is a big step forward. Now we can start using this in, in, in music making on stage, which I think is it's nice, and even in production. Contemporary AI system can support musical creativity. I strongly believe in that. And in particular, that now we have new tools, and these new tools can, end, can lead us to make new music. We know how to do an 808 kick sound. We have the tools for doing 808 sounds, you know? We have the tools for doing 909 snares. So why do we need a machine learning system to recreate that? We have new tools to create new music. That's, that's the overall thing. And just hot time, summertime, thank you. That's it. New Welcome. Sound. New Questions? Music, new sounds. Uh, I wanted, yeah, sorry. Oh, yeah, Franco, yes, please go ahead. I wanted to know um, how were you uh, triggering and sampling the RAID uh, autoencoder? Because uh, as far as I know, okay, you were mapping like a two dimensional space to a, like a 32 dimensional space, and that gives you a particular uh, yeah. sample or window of audio. So, what you were doing is each time you would change the the position in your two dimensional space, you would sample the rave again, right? Yep. There are that, there are basically two ways of uh, two modes of functioning with rave. So you can sample the latent you can sample the prior, you can sample the latent space directly. So you can move this playback head across all the dimensions. You can choose the number of dimensions at training time. So it could be two, it could be 32, 128, whatever. Or you can also somehow use condition the, that in another, uh, with other audio. So you can have audio as an input that will end up at a certain point in the space. And then you can use that in order to decode that. So in a way, it's kind of doing timbre, timbre transfer. But you can also do this, the two things at the same time. You can do this timbre transfer thing and then you can apply bias to the playback head so that you can you can have the playback head and then you move it at will and that's what i like to do actually and for example if you do if you want to do something rhythmic i can do i can use a very simple rhythm in order to have the playback head somewhere there and then i just play with the position of the head Okay, that's great because I was actually wondering how can you ensure continuity, right, on the rhythm or something like that when you, okay, so it's like Ex you have your conditioning that gives you this continuity when you apply this tabra transfer and then you apply the noise or the bias, whatever. To exactly, exactly. Nice. That's it. Very nice. Yeah. There, is a, there is a Discord for red discussions going on now. So you may like to take a look at that. If you want, I can send you the, the, the link in a few minutes. Yeah, yeah, good. that would be great. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Something else? I, I have another question uh, oh. related to an older um, like topic that you were mentioning. When you were codifying the, um, the symbolic music yep. with, um, with this 96th uh, division. Yeah. So each um, each bit was divided in 96, so that you could accommodate like uh, triplets and quivers. Each measure was divided yeah. in 96, yep. Yeah, but um, for, uh, for each instance, data instance, how long was in, in bits, how long was your, your analysis window or receptive field or whatever you would like to call it? Was it four, um, four bits or eight or? The vector input to the variational autoencoder, it's yeah. 864. Because you have you have your 96 points, but then you have your onsets, you have your velocities, and you have your micro timings. So you're encoded all of those. So that's your input. Then it's a very simple variational autoencoder, kind of we have a hidden layer of 512. 
and then we go to two two dimensions as the output okay great but in, in questions of um, um time how how many bits were you accommodating in the I, I don't care about time this is symbolic music it's it's like in midi there's no i mean no in symbolic music there is no idea of time you know it's one measure if it's one bpm per minute it'll be quite long if it's 300 bpm it will it'll be quite quite fast i care just about the onsets yeah yeah, yeah, like... but, yeah i understand sorry I, I don't know how to say it like each vector of yours that yep. was divided where each um where, where each bit was divided in 96 how many bits were you encoding in the vector oh no okay just just one measure so I, I'm going measure by measure by measure by measure. So the so the context that that's your question. The context is just the measure. I don't know anything about what happens before and after, which for musical for for music it's bad, you know, because someone sometimes we want to encode what happens before and after. But I don't care about the system kind of generating music by its own. I just want to encode kind of a measure. And then I can play, I can move around to play the next measure, which will have some variability. So for example, this is great because I can play a specific rhythm. And I know if I move my finger to some direction, I will get some variation. And that's good enough for me because you, you, you saw me there playing. So I was just moving a finger a bit so that to get variations in real time. It's kind of being drumming, kind of doing smaller things. Yeah, it's great. It's great. Thank yeah. you. That's what I want to say. Great. Cool. Thanks, Franco. Um, other questions? Yes, I have one. Hi. Hey, Blaze. Hi, cheers. Um, my question is actually really simple. Do you think a system like this can be used by a person that doesn't have any training? Like, this is not a performance. I want to just access to it. Like, yeah, you get someone from, let's say, I don't know, a concert, someone from the public, just get them. Yeah, of course. I mean, actually, actually, the RVA thing is deployed as a web page, mm. so you can play around with it. You can play around with it with stock sample sounds, mm -hmm. and that's and that's fine. Uh, there is also MIDI output coming in from the browser that you can also hook to anything. So you can you can use it, and and there is also deployed as an Ableton device. Yeah. yeah. So. You can load the device. You train on, on within Ableton, and then you use it. Mm. So you, you don't need to you don't need to know how to implement a neural network arch architecture to, to use it. Yeah, sure. Which I think it's part of the idea, no? Necessarily. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was also thinking like, you think there's a way, like for example, to make the controls maybe easier for some like. Let's say you're not an artist, like, and you want to use this tool, like, maybe some. I mean, because sometimes I feel like some controls are maybe really symbolic or maybe really connected to performance. So a performer, for a performer, is easy to understand them. Mm -hmm. for someone that has never played music, maybe they're maybe sometimes they're even counterintuitive. Mm -hmm. No. Yeah, perhaps perhaps for someone that doesn't make music. We may need to think, for example, in different labels for the different knobs and things. We can come up with names, for example, in, instead of threshold, we can use an name like kind of density or sound mm. density or things like that, or color, you know. But it, that's there you have an ex expert like Dr. Harlan Posaitis coming up with good words <laughs> so that it makes sense to to non-musicians to what what they can do you know yeah because but i think that to, uh, that i mean that totally a system like this could be fun to play with to people that don't make music yeah. one of the one of the ideas that mentioned that you remember at some point i was talking about um people were asking me if it's if it was possible to actually change the sound of the videos on the web browser Mm -hmm. Those were most of the time were non musicians. We musicians, we know that it's hard to, we don't know yet how to m make those changes. But people that were non musicians, they were telling me, Am I actually changing the sound? So that could be awesome, you know, that we provide an interface in which a non musician can actually steer the process 
towards mm-hmm. a certain part, you know, kind of in a video game that you are entering into another room and the music changes or something like that. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Nice. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Welcome. Harris? Questions? Yeah, I mean, so going back to that, uh, you know, multiple dimensions, um, I think I really like the idea of just using something as intuitive as the Wakinator. Um, and, you know, you define your own performance space, which could be two dimensions, five dimensions, seven dimensions. Um, and then, you know, you, you, cre- you explore a bit um, the larger dimensional Latin space, and you create like a mapping, a nice mapping tool that you can use. I think that's, that's mm-hmm. really nice. Um, what about, um, so for instance, uh, Drum Gun, right, uh, yeah. uh, by Sony, um, what they did is um, they have this like big dimensional Latin space, and actually you can select a different set of dimensions this time. So your your interface is two dimensional always. Your exploratory space. Yep. Then you can randomly select the pairs of uh, pairs of dimensions from I don't know, thirty two, sixty four. Is it actually even more than that? Um, is this something you are you have worked on or or explored or consider? No, the way I'm doing it, I mean, if you are just cho- choosing two dimensions, I think you are losing kind of the interaction between the other dimensions also. Unless you know what, that you are interested in those dimensions. Yeah. I think it's, I, I think it's because it's not, it's not one against the other. It could be one against the other and, in, and inter- interacting with all the other ones at the same time. I know that it's a way of simplifying things to do. You just choose two and you play with an X, Y grid. Mm-hmm. But I, yet you are losing depth there. Maybe if, maybe for the performance simpler, you know, and we, that's what we are trying to, to do, to come up with some something that we can explain the levels for non-musicians, you know, mm-hmm. these axes mean this thing, like the word that you would like to do. To, to find, you know, but we don't, but we don't know that. Yeah, and also I think something <coughs> that comes up um, in these questions is that if you have like a sixty-four dimensional space, even a thirty-two one, it's not very clear. There's, there's probably some sort of threshold after which um, dimensions are not that. Um, they they become very subtle, yeah. Like perceptibly, uh, perceptually. So um, this uh, it, it it's then super challenging to to even you know consider is it worth including them in some sort of exploration process or just not? Yeah. Yeah, I guess this was like this connects a bit with like yesterday we were talking about there was another presentation by one of of other PhDs and it was kind of unexplainable AI. So I think this kind of connects. Yeah. Like trying to understand what how to push this through labels and push like, you know, have lower dimensions and stuff like that. Maybe what you could be done is for example, if the if the variability is subtle in some parts of the space, which a lot of the space will be subtle, maybe we could somehow explore the space by a pro- programmatic mean. And try to come up with a series of numbers that say, okay, there is more change here or fewer right. changes here. And so then you somehow, you can reduce, you can apply a certain threshold and then you can end up, okay, this is the zone of the space with, where most of the changes are happening, changes are happening, something like that. Mm. But, but traversing that space may, may be quite slow also. For example, if you have that let's say 16 dimensions and you sample the space in 10 points, you have 10 to the power of 16. So it's anyway, it's, it's a huge thing to try to come up with that. But there, there, there should be certain ways of doing that in a fast way, you know? Good. Yep. 
Great, yeah. Um, I'm aware that we are quite uh, uh, about 30 minutes past our time. Of course, we had those issues in the beginning, but uh, yeah, thanks, thanks everybody for joining. And of course, thank you, Gabriel. That was um, great. Also, for me, an opportunity to finally get a closer view on on the stuff you've been doing on been yep. a few years. Uh, fantastic, yeah. Um, all right, great, yeah. Thank so, you, all of you. Thank you, all of you guys. Um, and I, since I mentioned the Discord thing, let me let me see if I can send you. I mean, for those of you interested in that, or I, I can send it to to Harris when I find it, and then yeah, you can sure, go sure, forward sure. it to the other people, other folks. Of course, of course. Okay. All right. So I'll stop the recording now. Thanks, everyone. Have ciao. Nice Thank bye, you. Gabriel. Bye. Bye. Ciao. ciao.